Yeah, I wish they had because that means that people are buying technology that's not up to the law. And I, know, I mean, a real solution is not saying they buy everything, but um, someone along the chain of command allowed them to buy technology from the FOIA contractors that you know, I think by the letter of the law is not good enough. So yeah, I agree with you. I, it's a difficult, it's a difficult problem, but I think we, it's not one you tackle head on. It's one that you find a workaround. I agree. I agree. There's two conflicting laws, and we have to find the best, not perfect solution. Yeah, I agree. And I think right now, in some ways, like because we're supposed to be tackling the hardest, the bigger challenges. That would in the advisory committee. So I'd rather be dealing with this than. Something that's easy for me, like in a way that back in well, the artist needs, we should I be think looking at. I think that we have some research to do. We have to find the citations about undue burden and when you can use disclaimers. I think that's the way forward. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. She did not see oh, it. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it would be a pity if we can't post the Declaration of Independence on Wait, you post the text of it? I just, I just, I just. Um, I know, he said, go this PDF didn't check out, go to your boss and say redo that. I mean, I'm in the private sector, but I would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> Your doctor didn't check out to be five ways to fly it. <laughs> Redo it, sir. <laughs> <laughs> So you're saying is that when they get, when the FOIA office gets the documents electronically, and then they need, they need to maybe redact something, they put it through another system that then actually strips out all the five ways. You gotta put it back in. You have to put it back in. That is not a Oh, I would even go. There could be a waste of resources. What if someone never? What if we spend ten minutes a page, which well, that's not too much of an exaggeration, and no one ever reads. No one ever needs to have this picture goes here. Like it's. I know it's a law, but we can say that it could be a wasteful law. Oh, yeah, it's a lot too. So. <laughs> Now, do you know who's on the, is it public, who's on the 508 open no. government plan? Can you talk about the open government partnership? Is that, do you know, are these people doing that, or is it other people? Okay. Hopefully they make it easier, not harder, for people that want to put information online. Yeah. And FOIA online, it's there. Enough. 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 Yeah. Is responsible for their own. Where does it go? Bill Smith, the 508 has FOIA. All right. Thank you all. Um, I hope you all had a nice break.
Um, I should also say before we start the next segment of our uh, meeting that there are some interest uh, in addressing uh, the 508 compliance from the members of the public. We will have uh, comments, uh, uh, time for comments from the members of the public. So um, if you would please, uh, you know, um, come to the microphone at that time and make your comments. Um, as I noted during our first meeting um, of our second term, your homework was to think about which of the areas you all identified during our brainstorming session that you think offers the greatest area to deliberate on the toughest issues in FOIA. And you have this awesome opportunity to work together and make concrete recommendations. Um, I would like to direct your attention to the meeting's minute from the previous meeting, which are in your folder, and also in attachment one, which are uh, pages 14 and 15, uh, that has all the topics you all identified, and attachment five to the meeting minutes is the list of themes that uh, emerged during our brainstorming discussions. Uh, for the we uh, viewing audience, I will briefly read the topics that were identified. Uh, the committee identified for deliberation the following topics. One was commitment and awareness. Two was delays. Three was volume, specifically electronic records. Four was funding. And the last topic, topic five, was technology. Um, so one of the issues the committee identified as potential topic to address over the next two years is the 508 compliance. As you all heard, under the 50, section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, Agencies must give disabled employees and members of the public access to information that is comparable to access available to others. Um, it was also suggested that the committee continue the work from the last term regarding proactive disclosure. Another suggestion was the committee might want to set up ad hoc subcommittees to address issues at particular agencies. And there was also much discussion about keeping pace with technology. Among some of the issues identified for this topic, technology, um, was the challenges that some agencies have to harness technology to manage the ever-increasing volume of records and assist with searches, database management and tracking, and producing records electronically. Uh, another theme that was identified is awareness and commitment. Among the issues and potential projects discussed under this area were the buy-ins from the agency and administration leadership and appointees, and also the creation of transition documents on FOIA for the next administration. We also considered creating a subcommittee that would focus on identifying and encouraging agencies to adopt best practices. Uh, another potential subcommittee might focus on requesters' issue trying to use the FOIA process. Uh, and final, the final suggestion on the list was setting up a subcommittee that can address issues with a particular request. And I think Nate Jones equated this potential subcommittee to acting as something like a FOIA firefighter. Now I would like to turn your attention during the next 45 minutes to discuss these topics for final selection and also identify subcommittees and members who will participate in each subcommittee for deliberating on the selected topics for the next six meetings. Um, would anyone like to open the discussion with a particular topic? Of course. Okay, so this is Kate Ross. I'm reading comments that Lynn Walsh sent in. She's unfortunately unable to attend the meeting by phone today, but I'm going to read out three things that she suggested. She said, I would like to advocate for breaking out technology in addition to these three area subcommittees, proactive disclosure, searches, and management. I think focusing on these searches and how FOIA officers are searching, what tools they use, et cetera, could add some valuable insight, hopefully creating some change. Maybe there are some best practices we could find within some agencies that other agencies could adopt. And finally, she said, I would be very interested in being part of a subcommittee that focuses on technology searches and management. So one area that one uh, member has identified is definitely technology. Great. Thank you. Anyone else?
Okay. I, I raised this issue briefly at the last meeting, but as far as the subject of technology goes, I still don't know what aspect of that we're talking about. It can be what anything that the it, subcommittee. Use of it. Sure. What, what, what do we mean? I mean, it's a very broad topic. It is. I, I suggest we narrow the focus. I, I think I have a, this is Mitra Abdullahi. I have a follow-up question that sort of the flip side of the same coin, which is when we speak about searches, um, often that obviously implicates a technological question as well, right? What is the database functionality? What is the search functionality? And so um, I'm sorry, I'm not hearing the comma between searches, management, and technology, if there is one. We, are we talking about searches and management or searches and technology? or searches, comma, management, comma, and technology, what are we um, discussing? Because I think with tech, some of the questions I have to help answer your question is, what are the technologies that are available agency by agency for running the searches? How do those technologies differ depending on the underlying databases that the, that the agencies have to search in response to a, a FOIA request? That kind of information that would help both, I think, requesters make better requests and understand whether delays are or aren't justified in terms of resource capabilities and the like. Anyone has any comments about this? Perhaps one of the things that we can discuss is to narrow the, the uh, uh, focus. This is, this is Michael Bakesha. I mean, I think when you talk about technology, you talk about records creation, records management, and then searching, processing, and technology when it comes to responding to FOIA requests. So I mean, I think we would need to look at, are we talking about the initial stages and when records are being created, how they're being managed, or then what technology is being used once a FOIA request comes in? Because it's searches as well as processing. I mean, redactions, are agencies using software to redact, or are they taking a magic marker and blacking things out, and then scanning and posting it on the website? So I mean, I think when you look at technology, you know, you have three diff very different aspects to it. Maybe, and this is Bill Holzerlin again, but maybe it makes sense to focus, to the extent we're talking technology, maybe we talk about the functions of technology we would like to see employed versus s wading into in, uh, endorsing specific types of technology, which we as federal employees really can't do. That's true. This is Chris Knopf, just to piggyback on that. It's, it's identifying the best practices and then looking <laughs> at the existing technology and how you can overlay that on the best practices to figure out how you can get the most out of it. It's not looking at the technology and identifying the best practices based on that technology. You've got, you got to start at the practices level. So it's all up to you to make that decision today. What aspect of technology is it that interests most and appears to be one of the challenges. And this should be both from the requester side as well as the agency side. You are correct when you say technology is just, you know, very broad. So let's narrow it down. Well, uh, so um, here's something that I've been thinking about, and I don't know if this goes in order, but I'll just throw my ideas and then we can continue discussing. But um, I think it would be beneficial if this FOIA committee tackled tangible problems. I think last time we had a tangible solution on fees that even though OMB is ignoring us, I think could eventually get more documents out to more people more quickly. And I, they're probably not ignoring us. They're probably working diligently on it. Um, so with that said, uh, I think we just heard about a big roadblock that potentially could blow up release to one release to all, in my opinion, 508. Um, so that could be a potential fix that we can do. And another one I'll throw out and we can discuss and take it up or not um, is uh, I believe, I think from filing lots of FOIA requests, the number one bottleneck is searches. And most of the time the FOIA officers themselves can't do the search. They have to beg and plead and plead and plead for other people in the agency that ignore them for sometimes five or ten years in, in, our, in our experience. Um, so I would say if we could fix or come to a solution or accommodation with 508, and if we could improve the search mechanism, those are two tangible things that I'd put on the table. Um, and we can use technology or not use technology to do either of those, uh, um, but. Sean? No, I was just, he actually clarified at the end. I was asking, I was gonna ask if, if, if he was saying searches as a technological challenge or as a management 
uh, challenge and an, an authority challenge, uh, which I think depends on the agency Either as to both. what's what's <laughs> I guess the the barrier. This is Chris Knox again, and, and I think digging a little deeper on the technology, I think technology is a subcomponent to many of these. I mean, the 508 should maybe even be its own, you know, release one, release to many, it, with ter in, in terms of 508 might be its own subcommittee. But also, I'd like to see some discussion about uh, process automation or process efficiencies through the use of technology, other workflows. It's not technology in of itself, but it's efficiencies and automations. Okay. Including maybe searches? Search may be its own, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I think, I, I think it, it's possibly a subcomponent of, of searches as well, yeah. Okay, um, I'm not sure what category this would go in under if it would be practices or special topics, but you know, I'm, I'm mostly interested in the historical uh, perspective, but especially the commitment and awareness, I guess, would, would be under because um, you know, I've certainly encountered at CIA, uh, mostly at CIA, you know, stubborn resistance. Um, and also, at my most recent request, I'll just one, one brief a anecdote, um, I, I filed a request for my current book project that deals with the Cold War in the early 1960s. And I was delighted to relatively promptly receive a nice fat envelope from the CIA, and I excitedly ripped it open. Uh, what they had done, it couldn't have taken more than two minutes, was simply go to the publicly accessible CIA FOIA website, type in the keywords relevant to my request, and print out what I had printed out years earlier, uh, the exact same documents. And I'm sure that went into their statistics as fulfilling a request, which completely violated the spirit of, of, of the law, which was supposed to uh, allow for in investigation. And one thing I was wondering about, is there any liaison, formal or informal, between this committee and the historical advisory committees of the State Department and the CIA? I don't know if the Justice Department you know, and, and FBI uh, or any other agencies have historical advisory committees. So information can be shared about problems relevant to FOIA? that you know, could be maybe you know, considered uh, collectively because you know, uh, this is an important group and, and it should be <coughs> communicating with these other advisory groups. So I do believe that there is a, uh, a chief FOIA officers council uh, that uh, uh, you know, we are, uh, we co-chair. Well, I'm, I'm this is something different. I'm talking about a, a, the CIA and the State Department. I don't know mm -hmm. if any other agencies have a historical advisory committee. Mm -hmm with a distinguished historian as the chair. This has been true for 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. which meets several times and reviews that agency's mm -hmm. fulfillment of its historical obligations to open materials, which include FOIA. But I have no idea whether or not any <laughs> liaison exists between this group and those groups. No. Sounds like there should be, unless you would like me to be that liaison, since I'm a historian, or Nada and I. Uh, but you know, we, we shouldn't all be separately trying to deal with the same problem. If we can put out a collective voice, if it's relevant, you know, that would make sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Mike. Yeah. Tom. Yes. Uh, first, just an observation. I, I would not use the CIA as an example to extrapolate from in terms of the work of the committee because uh, it's, it's, it's a, such a unique agency, uh, accounts for just a small number of requests, important ones, but I, you know, but I, having done business with them and sued them a few times, uh, they're sui generis uh, mm -hmm. in the FOIA okay. world. Uh, that's uh, probably good news. Okay. I, I, I wonder whether best practices couldn't be a umbrella for both technology and searches, because, I, I you know, just for example, learning that you know that there are actually people in uh, Homeland Security who are doing something that one of our members said, gee, this is a problem, uh, it suggests that elevating the best practices to a higher level of visibility among agencies for whatever it is uh, would be a useful thing. Um, uh, in terms of technology, I do think that there's a problem of what, what is, you know, how do you define what the technology, what are you going to use it for? Um, but some agencies obviously do wonderful things with it, for searching emails, for redacting, and those are best practices from, techno from the technological perspective that should be shared. And finally, and the same on the searches, I, boy, I'm always struck, I, I, I read the case summaries every two weeks, and there are probably more lawsuits challenging inadequate searches than any other issue. 
And it's just, a, and so in terms of saving time and money for agencies and requesters, uh, if we could be helpful in providing a level of comfort to the requester that the agency has followed appropriate best practices in carrying out a search, um, I think that would have a, a magnifying effect in terms of time, not just time saving individually, but across government. Anyone else? So do you guys want to vote on a particular topic? <laughs> we just got the FOIA, the FOIA just was amended. Yeah, no, I, having been involved in legislative fixes going back to mm -hmm. 1970, uh, I, I think that, that, would, that that's more than we need to bite off and uh, less than we could ever accomplish. There are at least three or four organizations in town working on legislative fixes, and I don't know that, uh, I, think, I think we are, our time is better spent uh, focusing on agency practices uh, than on Congress, which is, needs to be fixed itself. Uh, this is Ginger McCall. Um, we spoke at length last time about issues of resources and efficiency and funding. I do think that that would be a useful place for us to focus our attention. Um, it could be that some agencies are adequately resourced and they're just not efficient, perhaps. Um, and it could be that many agencies are inadequately resourced and inadequately funded uh, and don't have adequate staff to be able to manage the backlog that they already have or the volume of requests that they've been receiving more recently. I think it would be helpful for this committee to look at ways that agencies can increase efficiency uh, and if an agency is already efficient but is still under-resourced for this committee to make a recommendation for greater funding because there are a lot of new reporting mandates that come out with every iteration of FOIA bills and FOIA reform uh, and not any new funding. Okay, um, I wonder if this might not be a topic for uh, practices and maybe Tom can tell me if it's relevant for other agencies besides the CIA especially, because again I deal with <laughs> foreign policy history. Um, and the CIA, one thing that's been very frustrating for historians, is they've come up with a number of theological uh, exemptions to FOIA. In other words, for, for decades, they said all presidents' daily briefs, the daily reports to presidents, <laughs> that's like a lawyer-client communication. We're not going to really, we're not even considering. And then they decided, well, well, maybe we can. And they released hundreds of thousands of pages of them, and uh, predominantly, they were safe to declassify. Another example is they have had a policy for several decades of not releasing any biographical profiles, that it's a, a, you know, a, literary, a piece of literary craftsmanship. And yet, before that policy went into existence, a number of CIA profiles have been released in other files of other agencies. 90% of his stuff you can get from the New York Times man in the news or woman in the news profile. In other words, the best practice would be to seriously consider, can the re information be safely re released or is it detrimental to privacy, national security, or some legitimate category <coughs> under FOIA. So I, I think, I don't know if other agencies come up with theological exemptions to simply say this whole category is no, off limits. I mean, no, often. no, and I mean, there's no such, if we really, I mean, <coughs> there is no such thing as a theological exemption. Well, I, I mean, I just use that as a, a term mean, of art, I, I mean, categories. I know, but I mean, they're, they're withholding the information because it's classified under an executive order. There's tons of review procedures. No, but you know that. very well, classified is a completely subjective adjective. We had decided last time with our advisory committee, and I don't, I, this it came up, it comes to my mind again. We, with, with the first term of the advisory committee, we just said the issues of classification were something that we weren't gonna try to address because there's a whole slew of different bodies. There's ISU, there's different uh, organizations even within NAR that deal with classification. So we had decided on the first term that mm -hmm. issues of classification didn't, weren't, were not a likely productive source of, a, to a topical source for the advisory committee. And mm -hmm. I still echo, would echo that too. 
Um, what, one of my comments was, since I have the floor, mm -hmm. I, I grabbed the floor from you, I'm Please. sorry. <laughs> um, one thing that I think that we have not done yet, and I'm not sure exactly how to do it, but I feel like we, the, sort of the, the beauty of the advisory committee is that it's half requester, it's half agency, mm -hmm. half requester. And I feel like there's something there that we would be nice to be able to tap, where we do something, and maybe you know something sort of analogous, but something to to collectively make changes. And and like one, the one thought that comes to my mind is demand. We always talk about, you know, we always talk about agencies responding, but is there something we could do to help reduce demand, help reduce the pressure on FOIA? Um, is there, is there something there that the requester is? Is there something we could do with that? Yes. <laughs> Put more documents online with fewer yes. redactions. Well, exactly. Proactive <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, well, I mean, that's proactive. That's yeah, proactive. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, we're leading the release to one release also. I mean, uh, you know, you're just talking to the choir with that. Um, I, I guess I'm thinking more about alternative sources of, of access or their. Um, you know, other statutory schemes that would help? Well, I mean, this is Michael Bakesh again. I mean, that's why we shouldn't disregard legislative fixes so quickly. I mean, we have a body here of FOIA requesters as well as FOIA professionals from within the government, and there are no other organizations out there that are addressing both sides of the problem and what legislative fixes could be. So, I mean, that could be something that this committee could tackle with the experience on both sides sides that simply is not being addressed because when it comes to legislative fixes you have FOIA requesters putting forth what they think is great and then the government um, putting forth what they think is great and there's no discussion between the two about what can make the statute so much better and fix a lot of these problems so I'm not sure we should just disregard quickly legislative fixes. I think that's an excellent idea. Anybody? Uh, this is David Pritzker. Uh, Ginger McCall spoke about uh, looking at efficiencies or inefficiencies, and she, I think that she was mainly linking that to funding. But I'd like to suggest linking it to uh, Tom's suggestion earlier about identifying best practices. Seems to me it would be potentially fairly useful to identify which agencies are really handling uh, their, their FOIA uh, operations efficiently and uh, recommend what they're doing to, to the others. But by and large, agencies don't have any means other than perhaps what I've just suggested to know who's doing it better. Well, actually, 
actually, though, the, Melanie Puste, we do have, um, DOJ has been doing a best practices workshop seminar. It was part of our commitment under the national action, the second national action plan. So we have um, had a series of best practices where we identify agencies that do really well in, we've had technology, we've had backlog reduction, we've had customer service. Tom was on that and um, Sean was on that panel. Uh, it was that was one of our better programs. <laughs> the speakers were cap they were captivating. Um, so, but what we could do maybe to tie this together because we did the whole point of that was to identify agencies doing well and have that them share their best practices and then we have a page on our website where we identify the best practices. So it's a resource. We could have ideas for best practices workshops be you know, be generated through the advisory committee. I mean, I think that would that would be a great, you know, that's a great way to link the two enterprises. And, and part of what I had in mind uh, as an ultimate product is recommendations to agencies that these resources exist and uh, let, let them know uh, that they exist and how to take advantage of them. So would one of the topics be best practices? Show of hand. Best practices as li particularly yeah. linked to probably other issues yeah, as well. Just like on any yeah. best practices on anything connected with FOIA, improving FOIA, best practices to improve FOIA. Well, and I think well, this, is, a, this yeah. is Mishra Abedullahi again, and I think the, the value of that is, again, I think you know, part of our objective should be to try to make FOIA more accessible to people in a way that's not going to replicate the problems that are burdening the agencies now in terms of poorly made requests or duplicative requests or wh whatever. And so I feel like the, the umbrella term of best practices is an area where we can do something proactive and concrete and develop materials that would actually help both sides of the FOIA equation do its work more efficiently. See, I love the idea of the, helping people make formulate better requests or more clear requests or that's an example of something that can be on the other side. Ginger McCall, um, I also like this idea a lot because it's instead of creating sort of pie in the sky proposals, what we're looking at is what actual agencies have done and what has actually worked yeah. as a practical matter. So I think yeah. that this is a good idea. And I would think Thank like you, that David. some of the requesters could, you'll, you'd be able to identify, oh, we really like this, you know, we have this experience with this agency or this experience with this, and then that can be the shift that can help us build out a, um, a, a one of these workshops. We had one example here earlier this morning when the people from the 508, from the Access Board, pointed out a couple of agencies and said, look at their sites, look at what, and how they're dealing with 508. Yeah. Uh, how would we have known that? Yeah. And, and that, linking the problems with the agencies that have found solutions, it seems to me, is, is uh, a positive contribution we could make. So this is right now. I, I was actually listening along and when, when folks found that there's an interconnection between technology and any issue that we, we address, I also felt the same way about best practices. So where I think it was suggested that you know any committee or subcommittee take a look at technology as a part of the issue, that's the way I would have recommended um, Looking at best practices, mm -hmm. so any subcommittee um, who you know maybe maybe clearly there's going to be a 508 subcommittee. Okay, so then we would look at technology, but we would also look at best practices just to keep us focused. I think if we have a subcommittee that is best practices, it can go into a lot of different areas. Um, so I think that maybe um, just a thought would be to make um, each subcommittee or committee look at. Um, Best practices, Best practices as part of it. As part of it, as well as technology. And maybe, you know, anything else that somebody comes up with. But I think best practices, you know, would be a good um, way to write a suggestion or recommendations for change. So. Uh, this is Sean Moulton. Uh, I, I, think that, I think that could work very well. I was also worried about the very wide scope that a best practices. It's, it's a great idea and I do want us to get a lot of best practices. I think that as an outcome is, uh, is terrific. Uh, my suggestion was gonna be a little different. I was just gonna say, I think 
uh, maybe the best practices uh, subcommittee would then have to basically set up uh, sort of a rolling agenda where they did best practices in a particular area and moved on to another area rather than yeah. just kind of constantly talking about yeah. random best practices. If we wanted to do searches and you know websites technology or technology or yeah. um, then then we could do that, uh, but they could you know they could move on after two or three. Mm -hmm. Uh, sessions they might have these are the best practices this is our report back in this area mm -hmm. we're moving on to another area now mm -hmm. um, and, and the same thing for 508 compliance I think it's a, I think it is a good topic because uh, we can get some recommendations there uh, it could be very helpful but I also don't know that we're gonna make it two years on 508 compliance so I think it would be great if we had it as a subcommittee and then wrapped it up in, you know in less than a year <coughs> and then moved on those people onto something else I kind of like um, Melanie Pastey. I keep forgetting to say yeah. my name. Um, I do like the idea. I, um, I, from being those of us who were on the on the committee the last time, um, there is some. There is, a, 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 I think, an advantage to having things in cycles, like so that like we do something like a best practice, and then we have a report by the next committee meeting, mm -hmm. or so that instead of talking about it and then having a report at the end of two years. We have something, it's increment, build in, and maybe this is a suggestion just overall for any of our subcommittees that we have built in milestones um, along the way so that we're actually making progress towards some goal. Oops. Any comments, anybody? Well, I would just say in general, before we vote, I'd like to hear all the ones on the table because there's a lot of good ideas. Yeah. So. Sure. Uh, again, if, if you all would uh, turn to your. Um, attachment two of your meeting minutes. It has all the topics that we identified uh, or the themes that we identified, commitment and awareness, delays, volume, <coughs> funding, technology. And it has bullets under each theme. Um, if you would please spend a few minutes and kind of go over these. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah, but yeah, that's true. Except, yeah, it's this little short. Yeah, guide. that's yeah. correct. That's correct. That's a nice resource. Yeah. Okay, so if you look at uh, attachment five, the potential topics, 508 compliance, proactive disclosure, agency-specific subcommittees on a rolling basis, awareness and commitment, um, best practices, and actual FOIAs, practical emphasis. Okay, I'm just gonna go by the list. How many folks are interested on 508 compliance? Please, show of hand. Sorry, sorry. I don't. Is this meant to be the comprehensive list? Because like certain topics aren't even on it, like search and other topics, yeah. like 501 compliance, is perhaps a short-term um, issue. Best practices. We just had a proposal that that be a thematic glue and not a committee. I don't think this is what Nate is asking for. I think the first thing we need to do is maybe generate a list right now of actual committee topics, and okay. then we can go around. Right. I like that idea. Okay. So just just taking notes from what everybody said, uh, uh, just some of the themes that, that I pulled out, search and, and, and understanding that best practices and technology being a subcomponent of each one of these. Mm -hmm. Search, uh, and, and some of these will last the entirety, some a couple of meetings. Search, 508 compliance, uh, resource efficiencies, whether it's uh, funding or uh, the human element, uh, and proactive disclosure. That's not exhaustive, that's just what I pulled out. That's correct. And then there's one way of looking at this, like then under each one, you, we would be looking at both best practices for that topic and, and technology, technology for that topic. 
Okay. That's kind and of a nice also, way to maybe package Maybe also identifying them. the agencies that are doing that particular topic well. Yeah. And bringing yes. real world yeah. practicality into it. Yeah. So it's sort of three things under for each for each topic. Jim Hirschberg. This is Mark. Oh. I think that's a really nice list and nice way of breaking up the A couple things. I, I see that agency-specific subcommittees is listed, but there hasn't been any discussion of that. Did anyone have anything particular in mind? Because, you know, I mean, there, again, uh, Tom and I have had an exchange about the CIA, you know, whether it makes sense, you know, having another voice to nag the CIA to be more open, you know, whether that would help hurt or be a waste of, you know, just a pure waste of time. And the other thing is the, be is the idea for a best practices subcommittee also a worst practices subcommittee, in other words, pinpointing uh, problems uh, and, and, and failures that, you know, really need to be redressed. In other words, not just, you know, aspirational, but pointing out issues, you know, where either across the, 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 the board or specific agencies, you know, are, are really uh, causing problems, you know, that could be redressed. I mean, I, I think personally, if we identify best practices, perhaps that's something that, you know, of course, Melanie will be uh, posting on, you know, the best practices website, that for agencies that are not doing, um, you know, or not, are, are, you know, <laughs> worst practices, I guess, would be able to sort of see and, and uh, uh, you know, adopt the best practices rather than pinpoint, you know, what are the worst practices. Okay, you, you don't think it would be, Jim Hirschberg again, it would be useful for us to shame particular agencies? Um, no. Or to shame, con or no, to shame, to shame Congress for, for not funding, you know, what, what needs to be done? And, and Nikki, this is Bill Holzerlin. Um, I think there's some challenges for the federal employees on this board, um, yeah, on this committee, uh, with those ideas, just put, yeah. puts us in an untenable yeah. kind of position. Yeah. But my understanding of the purpose of um, of engaging in, in, in subcommittee work so that ultimately we can come up with recommendations That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to the archivist um, for addressing certain issues. So I don't know that coming up with a list of, you know, a, a, a naughty list on certain yeah. topics is really going to, I mean, we... No, I, I was being we, flippant. I, I mean, I mean yeah. problems that can be addressed. Sure, yeah. uh, sure. Well, well, some of the things I think we're, we're we have to get trying to make... to you on the committee, that's all. Recommendations <laughs> on how to solve the problems, we all agree, a lot of us agree that there are these problems. Yeah, and I think one of the things that, that can come out of this is, um, you know, I heard legislative fixes. Um, you know, perhaps during the best practices discussions uh, in, in your subcommittees, one of the things that could come out of it is perhaps a guidance from OIP um, that you know, provides guidance to agencies. And most agencies do follow those guidances. So you know, by identifying best practices um, or perhaps you know, discussion of you know, it, it would be best to fix this legislatively, right now maybe something that OIP can do is provide guidance to agencies and say, OK, this is the best thing that we've heard. This is what the committee recommends, and here's, here's this guidance. Um, I, I have to say, too, with the, even teasing the, the, the two committee members who were on our customer service um, uh, best practice seminar, they ha it has really been incredible to listen to the ideas and the, the things that agencies are doing. And it's surprising um, sometimes the things that people have come up with. Smaller agent, we had a best practices from smaller agencies, and you would, it, it was, so nice to hear all this innovative things that the smaller agencies with low volume FOIA had still done a lot of thinking and, and had some nice ideas. So I do think in a, it, it's just kind of, it does fit nicely with the idea of like, let's look across the whole federal government at what's going right and mm -hmm. capitalize on it. This is me, Trevor I have a point of clarification. It was really helpful to have that list. So search, resource efficiency, 508 compliance, and proactive disclosure. And my question is about the proposed concept of a resource slash efficiency something committee. My question is, um, I'm looking at attachment two, the longer attachment, and I'm trying to figure out, uh, as perceived by members of the committee right now, does the concept of a, of, a, of a subcommittee that focuses on resource efficiency, does that 
also look at delays, both in terms of poorly made requests and handling of requests. <coughs> to me, that's a natural place for that concept, but it's otherwise not reflected in the list. Um, it's also, I think, a place to think through limited resources or, like for example, if there's a smaller agency that has a, a smaller office, mm -hmm. if we understood that better as requesters, it could inform the way that we make requests for information. It could help further the process and speed things up. That's not per se efficiency in the more narrow sense of the term, but it certainly is in the broader sense um, and goes back to this concept of how can we as a committee with real experience on both sides of FOIA help be a resource to the public seeking to make FOIA work for them. So I just wanted to ask that point of clarification and if delays aren't most organically in that subcommittee, ought we have another committee or subcommittee that focuses on some aspect of that issue? So I think that, you know, that's a really good in, um, uh, analysis. To me, both volume and delays play some part. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, if, if you're talking <laughs> about these very, very broad and very, um, I think broad is the, the broad, term, yeah. uh, the requests, sweeping, sweeping. sweeping. Complex I mean, versus yeah, simple. exactly. Yeah. Uh, and it, which, which requires the agency to spend so much time searching for records and then the volume itself, um, any and all, I mean, and no, there's no time limit, there's no focus. Uh, that could be very burdensome for the agency. Um, so that, that plays into volume and it also plays into delay. Um, right, and, and as someone who's made those requests, I'll tell you <laughs> that one of the reasons I do it is because I don't know what I'm looking for. Yeah. And that's something that the gut, it's like a, there's a one-sided, yep. There's an information asymmetry. If I knew better how the record, what records existed, how they were maintained, I could make a more precise request. But because I don't, I'm groping around in the dark, you get the any and all complex FOIA. And so that's where I think there's real work to be done in a committee like this to try as much as we can in the limited time that we have to narrow this problem a little bit more and make the, the statute more functional for both parties involved in it. Ginger McCall, um, I, I, the FOIA Public Liaison's Office, I, I believe, is supposed thinking. to serve that function, and they should reach out, Just obviously. Um, but I certainly think that delays and volume could be factored into the efficiency and resources question to look at agencies that have a high volume but still manage to process those, those requests would be helpful. Um, in the last version of this subcommittee, we had where the last version of this committee, we had three subcommittees. Uh, and what I heard when Chris listed off things that we've talked about today as potential subcommittee topics, searches, 508, proactive disclosure, and resources and efficiency. 508 and proactive disclosure certainly are, are two things that go hand in hand with each other. I think we could combine those into a single yep. subcommittee and, and then we could have the other two topics uh, which would sweep in also delays and volume. Um, and we have three subcommittees. And I just want to, uh, just for the record, I want to add some of our colleagues proposed legislative fixes. So I think that should at least be on the table if we vote. I just that, don't want that to yeah. get excluded from the list. Oh yeah, definitely. And also that might be a thing that fits in best, like we've discussed having best practices and technology as a facet of every subcommittee. Legislative proposals, I think, mm -hmm. would be an excellent thing to come yeah. out of a subcommittee sure. report. This is David Pritzker again. Um, when I have a problem and seek assistance, one of the principles I'd, uh, that I, I've found uh, applies is if the person that I want to help me doesn't understand the problem, you, I'm never going to get useful solutions. And with the same thought in mind, it seems to me, well, we, one of our attachments, attachment four, was how can the committee be effective in tackling the hardest issues? And several of these items say, fix or improve the problems, F focus on what's working and what's not working, <coughs> identifying the technology problem. It seems to me that f uh, the, our approach to finding what's working and not working oughtn't be, uh, uh, and I understood that it was a matter of rhetoric, shaming or not shaming. It's not who are the good guys and who are the bad guys, it's what's causing the delays, 
Uh, Tom said earlier that uh, most of the litigation uh, is about inadequate searches. What's <laughs> causing inadequacy of searches? But in that sense, if we identify what the problems are, that would help us to uh, link them up with potential solutions. I just, just uh, it's Melanie again. I mean, I obviously I review all the FOIA cases as well. And just so that it's not, we're not morphing what Tom said into several steps. Where, I mean, I certainly see plenty of cases where searches are challenged, but plenty of times the government wins. The mm -hmm. search is challenged, but the search is upheld. So it's, and it's so case specific. But, but um, my point, Melanie, was that if one of the problems is that searches are inadequate, what we can do perhaps to be helpful is to identify what's making them inadequate and look for uh, ways to improve that. Well, I mean, I think search is a great topic as a best practices, best practices in searches, finding efficiencies for searches, using technology to assist searches. You know, I think it's, it's certainly a topic in that sense. I just wanted to correct sort of the, the impression that it's, uh, this is Tom. It's not an impression that I intended to give because it does seem to be that education of requesters mm -hmm. is an important mm -hmm. element mm -hmm. in reducing mm -hmm. litigation. Mm -hmm. yep. And if the agency follows the best practices, is known to follow the practices, and comes back and says, we couldn't find anything, then that should be the end of it. But because it's spotty and because some agencies don't, then it's not the end of it. But I, I want to come back to the legislative. I mean, I, when I introduce myself, I said American Bar Association. I, I run a 16-person legislative affairs staff. That's all I do in my day job. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, with all the, you know, the, the, the requester community can't even agree among itself what the next mm -hmm. legislative agenda should be. And frankly, in 50 years now, the government has never agreed with the outside world with what the next legislative, well, 1986 slightly, okay, some compromises on both sides, but that was it. So I, I really feel very strongly and hate to repeat myself, but I think it is a just gross waste of our time to look at the legislative issues. And some may derive from some of the things, I mean, it may be that we would suggest, that the 508 committee may suggest that working with the access board that a slight fix to, you know, could, could facilitate dealing with that issue or something of that sort that would come out of our examination of specific problems. But to sort of start with a, here's a piece of paper, where do we start with the legislative fix, I think is a um, uh, not likely to yield constructive results. And who knows, maybe the topics that you guys pick could end up later on to be a legislative fix once you all deliberate on it. You know. Um, um, whatever that may be, if it's a 508 issue, you know, it could <coughs> later on be a legislative fix. But as Tom said, having a subcommittee as, you know, four legislative fixes, I think that's, it's not doable. <laughs> maybe it could um, be a subcommittee, this is right now, maybe it could be a, a subcommittee on um, like, like what has been proposed here, awareness and commitment of senior leaders. Um, I think that's a, a, a good way to address the resource issues that um, Ginger brought up. Um, maybe some of the, um, the issues that were brought up as far as um, delays. Um, I think because FOIA is typically buried under a lot of somewhat the lower levels of, of government um, and um, probably doesn't get the, the respect or attention it deserves until it's on news. I think that's a clever way to kind of get senior leaders to buy in and give them some, some clear recommendations on how to run their programs internally for the, um, for the FOIA office as well as the requesters. So I think that would be a good subcommittee in short. Um, the one on awareness and commitment of um, the senior leaders of each agency. Shall I ask and see if um, people are ready to vote on? Okay. All right. You know, so you know, give we've got. Shot. I know. <laughs> give it a shot. <laughs> uh, so best practices, which will include also technology. Um, and exa and exa highlighting, and examples, highlighting positive examples, positive examples. A specific agency. 
show of hands? Oh, can we read through them all first? Oh, that's a good idea. You mean? Uh, so all the, op so all so all the, the options, options are on the table. Okay, so what I have is best, best practices, uh, funding, um, which would be resources, and then within that, it would also include delays and volume. Um, then we have proactive disclosure, and within that, the 508 compliance. We have search, which would include best practices, technology use, education of you know for the request requesters. Um, we talked about legislation and 508 compliance, which is part of proactive disclosure. Am I missing something else? Can you explain uh, awareness you and, of course, I'm sorry. Did you say I'm sorry, Mr. Hersher, could you explain yeah. why 508 is part of proactive disclosure? I thought that's what we discussed, because proactive disclosure, you know. I think on the theory that to the extent that what is happening at least some of the time is that proactive disclosure is being um, affected by the exactly. potentially competing obligations that the agencies are trying to balance under 508. That was, yeah, it was my suggestion, Ginger McCall, uh, to combine those two things because it seems like 508 is, as Mitra just said, oftentimes tied to proactive disclosure. It's a hurdle that agencies bring up when the requester community brings up the proactive disclosure proposal. Oh, okay, it just, it just ended at yeah. 508, but it's broader than that. Could the research, it seems to me that you've read, for, uh, Tom Sussman, you formulate resources, including delay and volume, and that's kind of beginning with putting the cart before the horse, maybe. I mean, if the issue is delay and volume, resources may be an, an answer, may not be an answer. I mean, I hate, I, I don't want to start with resources, the problem now, let's look at what, what it causes. So um, I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to think of how to formulate that one so that it would include resources, but not be subsumed by it. I think focusing, this is Ginger again, focusing on delays and backlogs and perhaps comparing the ways that agencies use their resources, technological resources, human resources, monetary resources, uh, would be a good way to structure that. Because I had suggested resources and funding, but perhaps focusing on the problem and the downstream effects of inadequate resources or inadequate funding would be a good place to start. You look like you still have a question. Well, I, I, yeah, this is Tommy. It, it sounds to me like you're saying the resources uh, are is now merging into best practices. Because if well, you, as we've already discussed, best practices would be an aspect of every committee that we're looking okay. at. Yeah. Right. My my interest in talking about resources and efficiencies is looking at actual practices within agencies who. Who is able to handle their backlog and why? You know, who, which agencies allocate more or less resources? What's the effect of that? What sort of technological resources are being harnessed by agencies? And if we find that there aren't enough budgetary resources being given to an agency to enable the agency to harness technology and people power to manage their <laughs> backlog and current request load, then this, uh, the committee, the subcommittee, would make a recommendation for more resources. I mean, that. That's what I'm interested in focusing on, but I think that the backlog, if we want to start from the other end and look at backlogs comparatively uh, and processing and volume comparatively and how agencies manage those things, that would be helpful. Yeah, it, it, this is Tommy. You know, I, it, I think efficiencies before resources. I like yeah. starting with efficiencies uh, as in describing it. And it also seems to me that, that, that the subcommittees can work out you are going to involve best practices in each of these, and if there's a separate subcommittee on best practices, they're going to have to figure out amongst themselves so there's no overlap. But I'm okay not resolving that in the next... Yeah, so I, I guess, Nikki, to amend my proposal with budgets and funding, I would change it to efficiency, because I think that's what I'm, what I'm getting at there. <coughs> All right, so... Um and then, sorry, just one quick clarification. So the list had best practices at the top, but we did have a conversation about potentially incorporating that theme into every subcommittee. And this goes to Tom's point, which is that if there's a best practices committee and then each subcommittee is already also looking at best practices, we're going to have some weird overlap. Are people around the room comfortable with eliminating best practices as a standalone subcommittee 
Anyone dissent? Raise your hand, maybe. That's what houses technology right now, though. Where would that go? No, no. no. every no. committee. Technology is in each. Oh, technology is going to yeah. each and one. As well. Practices. So right, tech so. and best practices are consistent in themes in every subcommittee. Yeah, we were, we were talking this That's right. Right. We were talking about adding best practice. Underneath each subcommittee, there'd be a component of best practices, technology, and identifying where agencies are actually doing so this well. So that would leave us with 508 efficiencies and resources and then search legislation and awareness as the yeah. ones to choose from. Okay, I think so. I'm going to have to read right, this one. Okay, efficiencies and resources. There was a, a mention by Rennell also of awareness and commitment. I think yeah. that we could look at that under the umbrella of any of these topics too, to look at agencies that have done a good job of, of getting buy-in from management. So the, the three items that can be looked at for each subcommittee would be best practices, technology, awareness, and commitment. Yeah. And potentially legislative fixes if the subcommittee decides that that would be useful. Okay. So then Some people are still down. buying into the, the democratic yeah. process, <laughs> Tom. <laughs> yeah, it does. And it really yeah. narrows There's it down. There's nothing point. to vote. It's funny. Yeah. So it's, uh, we've we got efficiencies and resources. Exactly. So we've got three, I think, uh, that came out of it. Efficiencies <laughs> and resources, which touches upon the funding. Um, a proactive disclosure um, and file weight compliance. Um, searches, right? Yep. 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 That's right. And I think that's it. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we've got. <laughs> All right. Let me write this down. And could the people who were on the committee the last time um, maybe explicate whether you're, you, do people just select one or is it two or how does it work? I'm really sorry, I, I wasn't. No, that's okay. I, uh, just for those of us who are new members who weren't on the previous iteration of the committee, our members, uh, do they choose to be on one subcommittee or two subcommittees or? So that's, that's going to be something I'm gonna talk about right okay. now. Okay. <laughs> So as a reminder, each committee member is expected to participate at least in one subcommittee. Each subcommittee will have a maximum of nine committee members. Um, and the subcommittee chairs will head up the work on these projects and will contact the team to discuss the next steps, which might include setting subcommittee <coughs> meetings or phone calls, um, you know, however you guys want to work that out. Again, all subcommittees must include Kate Russ, the designated federal officer, on all subcommittee matters to ensure that the committee is complying with the uh, FACA uh, requirements. And so what we can do right now is sort of, uh, I, I will invite the vol uh, members to volunteer for um, you know, serving on these three subcommittees that we identified. So do we have any volunteers to chair the subcommittee on Resources and, I'm sorry, e efficiencies and resources. I will volunteer, Ginger McCall. So she is going to be our chair. We'll have a co-chair, right? Yeah. We had so co-chairs last time. Just a point of order. This is Kay Rouse. There needs to be one government co-chair and one representative co-chair okay. for each subcommittee. Uh, I'll co-chair that one. Okay. Ginger and Chris. Okay, anybody um, of the members here want to serve on this subcommittee? We have a show of hands. Um, Kate, are you? And people on the, uh, on the phone interested on serving on uh, the subcommittee? We, ju we just identify resources, I'm sorry, efficiencies and resources. That's not. That's correct. That's correct. Okay, so how many folks do we have? Five. five total? Okay. So do we have any volunteers to chair and co-chair the subcommittee on proactive disclosure 508 compliance issue? <laughs> Nobody? This is, this is murder. Okay. 
Can I need a government member, please? Maybe it's Bill Holzer right now. I'll go chair. Oh, fantastic. <coughs> okay, members who would like to volunteer. So we have... We have five, I think. Anyone on the phone? Jill? No, okay. I'm just up for <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Okay, so uh, topic three is uh, subcommittee on search. Anyone who wants to chair? I'd be willing to. Okay, Nate. I need a government member, please. I can do it, thank you. All right, Logan. Okay, who, uh, how about the members who want to serve on the subcommittee? We have one, two, three. Did, did you get them all, Kate? Did you get everyone? Uh, has everyone volunteered for one? Uh, yeah. So if you have a volunteer for committee, yeah. Or we may be. Excuse me, uh, Jim Hirschman. Nikki, uh, can't some of the membership issues be settled by email afterwards? You know, isn't that yeah, something that's that. That's true. Maybe people want to think about it. I mean, or, yeah. I mean to save time and get to public comment. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, we can do that. So those of you who didn't volunteer, um, you do have the time to think about it and then maybe send us an email uh, volunteering on serving one of the subcommittees. <coughs> okay? Yes. All right, great. All right, so now we're going to go to public comments. Um, at this time, I would like to turn to the members of the audience. For the next 15 minutes, we will take comments and... Uh, comments from the folks in, the, uh, in attendance. But before we turn to, uh, to the audience, I do want to alert the members about uh, a couple of emails we received from FOIA requesters or other members who asked us to print, it, to print their emails for the members to read. Um, in each of your folders, you will see an email from other uh, individuals who've had concerns uh, about a FOIA request or the handling of a FOIA request. Um, I will say that in one of the uh, uh, emails you will read, uh, uh, OGIS was also uh, involved and we, we were able to um, provide the assistance that the requester had asked by going to the agency. So please review the emails if you wish to discuss it further, uh, for, you know, and, and maybe in any of your subcommittees, please contact Kate. One quick comment on the emails. Uh, I would like to state publicly that it's, one of them is a long problem, but I will comment that using the B-5 exemption to withhold a document that's already was released in the public domain is not acceptable, and we see it all the time. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so with that said, I request that those of you um, with questions and comments to please approach the microphone. And for the record, please state your name and uh, any organization that you're affiliated with, if, if that's appropriate. Great, thank you. Hello. Yes. It works. Wonderful. Hi, my name is Cindy Caffaro. I am uh, the Departmental FOIA Officer for the Department of the Interior, but I speak in my personal capacity. Um, I would like to say congratulations and thank you to the committee um, for working on the issue of 508. Um, over two years ago, the issue was raised, um, and I think it was a bit of a surprise to some people. As Mr. Sussman mentioned, um, you know, I think a lot of folks hear about 508 and the concern is, is this an excuse? Mm -hmm. Is the, you know, are agencies using this as a, some kind of get out of jail free card? Mm -hmm. And I think what we heard really clearly today is, or I, what I heard very clearly today is, we haven't been exaggerating. Um, yeah, we heard people say very clearly that if it can't be made accessible um, under 508 standards, then it shouldn't be up at all, mm -hmm. or it should be taken down. And that that is, that is what the agencies have indeed been hearing. And that is indeed the fear that we have. And so when we hear wonderful suggestions like what OIP is working on with Ms. Pustay and you know, all these many things, for many of us, 
it is the exact same people who are doing the FOIA processing that are doing the 508 processing. Uh, we all do, yes, we have a 508 person who's the designated representative, but in many cases they have no staff. And so it's, you know, it's, it's nice that we have a contact that we can ask questions <laughs> of, but that's not to say that you know, they can provide us assistance. And so every, every moment that we're spending on 508 accessibility for many agencies is time that we are not spending on providing materials for FOIA. So I truly appreciate that you're gonna be addressing this really important issue and best wishes and best of luck. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yes, of course. Um, thank you, Cindy. And I remember you, we talked about this years, I remember fondly, so hopefully we get it done. But uh, just a quick response and clarification. I, th well, maybe we'll have to go back to the tape, but I think when we asked them, they said, um, of the million of documents online that potentially are not 508 right now, do they have to come down? I think they said, no, they don't have to come down. So that's a small victory, hopefully. Well, it was an interesting point because you may have noticed that, you know, one person was saying, oh, no, absolutely not. And one, and one person was saying, oh, yes, they absolutely do. And so it was uh, also the idea that was mentioned about, I don't want to get too deep into your weeds, but uh, one thing that was brought up, well, you can put up a disclaimer. I can tell you we are actively discouraged from putting up disclaimers. You know, the idea is, is that some people think of that as if, you know, we're trying, some people think we're trying to circumvent FOIA, some people think we're trying to circumvent 508, and the idea of putting up a waiver is seen as if we're doing that, then we're not really fully complying with our obligations under 508. And so we, we feel like we're between a rock and a hard place, and I think as we saw today, there is some, even within the 508 community, uh, their gut reaction was quite different that I was seeing, you know, just from the body language of the heads going, yes, 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 and no, 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 so. Well, I'll have to do some research to see when we can use disclaimers, and we'll have to see what defines an undue burden. So we've got to work it out for this. Thank you, Cindy. Hey, Nikki, yeah, uh, w one quick response, uh, and I'm a complete 20th century ignoramus as far as up-to-date technology, but is one possible way to address some of the 508 issue, instead of each agency grossly understaffed having to deal with, with this individually, if, if there is technology and especially software that can deal with whole categories of documents, why not have the government simply make that software available to download on a request and it could be the requester who does the processing instead of the office that is responsible for the processing? You're suggesting offloading the burden of OCR to the requester community? Uh, yeah. It's an interesting idea. Uh, I hear from and, and, and again, instead of each individual yeah. agency having to figure it out individually, if there's oh, uh, a I'm technological fix, let the requester deal it. Do it. But I don't know if uh, someone with uh, uh, blindness or uh, can can make that kind of well, well ma make this site that would offer that technology uber accessible, especially through the association. If someone's blind, they're spending their whole life blind. Uh, so, you know, th so they, they would have organizations yeah, that they deal with yeah. for accessibility purposes. Yeah. Uh, okay, but I just wanted to put it on the table because yeah. sure. I'm, I'm hearing each individual agency having to address this incredible burden. Uh, hi, uh, Alex Howard from the Sunlight Foundation. I'm, I have to twitch when you say Uber accessible because you, uh, if you I actually mean, look, I, mean, I don't mean Uber itself. Well, but Uber, in fact, is hostile to accessibility. And I don't mind I saying wasn't referring that on to the, the record the, the organization because they are, in fact, I think, looking at some of the same issues where you have um, a technology company uh, that has extraordinary 21st century technology um, that may be taking on paratransit functions in cities, um, and there's real questions about whether they are replacing taxis that are providing accessibility to the public. And so <laughs> it's it, it's a it's a it's a completely random thing. I don't let, want to let the record record it. that I have changed the word Uber to extremely yeah. in my comments. <laughs> I, I wanted to bring a comment on a, um, a somewhat different issue. Uh, one of the stories I wrote before I joined Sunlight was about uh, Open FDA. And if you haven't looked at it, take a peek. Uh, it was an approach um, where they tried to put immense amount of, of uh, adverse reactions on the internet um, in an open machine readable format as the president ordered, something that hasn't come up at all today for some reason. and. Um, to do so with millions of records. And they had a huge backlog of actually digitizing these things. 
So they went to a uh, California-based, Silicon-based, uh, Silicon Valley-based startup um, called Captricity, uh, which was founded by someone who'd worked in the aid and development space, uh, was frustrated by trying to get paper forms into um, digital form. And actually it came up with an, a, a combination of crowdsourced and machine learning and an optical uh, work. You basically take a picture of it, it pulls it onto the internet, and then has people look at it, identify what's in certain fields, and then its output is machine readable data. Um, that was manifestly faster and cheaper than what the federal government currently had on avail uh, available to it, and that data is now online and is now being used to calculate trends and adverse reactions and understand where and how different drugs could kill somebody. That is the kind of approach that should be, I think, front and center here. It feels like process and not stepping back a bit to push towards recommendations which look at IT modernization and an adaption, adoption, and pushing for things which enable FOIA officers to be creating um, records in concert with other people that are digital by default, that are open by default. If you create data that's open by default that has, and then put it into a picture and then release that as a PDF, then you have a problem. And that's exactly what the IRS was doing with nonprofit tax returns that were filed in digital form to begin with. It took a FOIA lawsuit against the IRS to win, but now that data is in an open machine-readable machine format hosted on Amazon at dramatically less cost to the American taxpayer, providing insight into what's like $2.1 trillion segment of our economy. Now, 40% of the tax returns still aren't there because they're still filed on paper. Until that part of the process gets fixed, then there's an issue. This comes back to whether something is created open by default. I saw the conversions for 508 in there. They were for .doc, .xls, .pdf, .ppt. What do all those things have the same? They're all proprietary formats made by huge technology companies. If you all publish plain text on the internet, on HTML pages, this issue goes away. It's accessible by default. This committee itself is still putting PDFs on the internet, not web pages. I think the extent to which the, this modernization issue and this question of whether something is created open and accessible by default at the beginning will address a lot of the problems down the road that you're talking about. And the more that you're trying to chase after the issue of getting PDFs to be meta tagged and kind of going in through them and OCRing it, like that's valuable work. There should be a national scanning initiative. We're sitting in an institution which is putting up platforms to enable the American people to look at scanned documents and identify what's in them and to make them accessible for everyone. That's something we should do. Sunlight is 100% committed to making access to information accessible to everybody. And we'll never back away from that. But when I hear the idea that we should be taking down documents from the internet because they're not accessible, it's exactly the wrong direction. When I hear the idea that 508 could be used as a barrier from putting up documents on the internet, I say that's the exact wrong direction. If we want to really get to the heart of this, it's still about power and it's still about putting up roadblocks to making sure that FOIA requesters get what they want in a timely fashion. And I am sure that if the mission is to say, well, we need to make sure this document is accessible, then there's a huge collaboration of people across the country and frankly across the world who would be willing to work doing that. Go look at what the uh, Smithsonian and the archives has already done with crowdsourcing conversion of images and documents already. And think, how could that be put to use digitizing and converting images? I want to be careful in my language here because it's an honor to be here and get to speak to you, but it's farcical to claim that accessibility should be a barrier to putting these things online. Don't let that happen. Make sure that there's no impediment to making sure that people's access to information isn't stepped on because of this. This is something that modern technology can help with. I was at Facebook within the last year and I watched a blind scientist show me how their new machine learning algorithms can tell you not only what's in a picture, but how the person feels about it. That's where we are with technology now. 
So are we really going to say that we can't figure out how to digitize documents and get them online? We can't do open formats by default? I don't think so. And I hope you won't say that either in your recommendations. Thank you, Alex. Uh, my name is Michael Ravnitsky. I'm uh, pro speaking as a private individual uh, seeking employment. Thank you very much for the opportunity for public comment, especially about the uh, important issue of Section 508. I'm glad you're talking about this issue. Most FOIA material is pre-existing records, not the creation of new records. So a lot of this discussion about creating new records is not <coughs> terribly relevant to the, the primary issue at hand. Um, and sadly, Section 508 is used sometimes as an excuse or a red herring to make certain decisions. Uh, I agree with the previous speakers on that. Uh, but increased access under 508 has the side benefit of improving access for everyone. Just the, like the example of the curb cut, it helps everyone who happens to be needing to bring wheels over a curb, not just a wheelchair user. And uh, in the same way, when you make things accessible under 508 or you OCR them or you make them better, more easily accessible on the web, you help a hundred other people as opposed to every single person that may be visually impaired or otherwise. It's really for everyone else too, and it's significant. Um, when you take into consideration 508 obligations, it helps people like me who find that we need reading glasses and distance glasses, and we have to try to juggle them because we're not ready to go to bifocals yet. Um, most discussions about 508 in the FOIA context I've seen descend into complaints about resources and IT departments and lack of institutional support. And I think that's a, that's a really wasteful way to go about this decision because that's a false binary choice. It's not either or. When you put more stuff up, it can get crowdsourced privately uh, even if the government isn't intending to do that and then it's made available in a synthesized form that's more available to everyone including people who are unable to access in the original non-508 format. Um, so in a sense, the perfect is the enemy of the good here. But things can improve today with some simple steps. As more and more requests are fulfilled electronically, requesters have been receiving some pretty horrendous records. I hear this from a lot of people. There's skewed pages, sideways pages, upside down pages, missing pages. There's the teeny tiny print problem where a file is released, maybe it was an Excel file and it's released as a PDF where the print is so small that even if you blow it up, you can't really see it. And something that some blogs uh, have uh, publicized and shown examples of. There's speckle documents which make file sizes unnecessarily huge and they also make it very difficult or impossible to OCR a document. But that could have been avoided just by setting a contrast a little differently during the scanning process. Requesters receive files that are gigantic but contain only a few pages because they were scanned and converted without a due care, without um, the advantages of, of thinking about it a little bit before you stick it in the scanning machine. OCR documents and FOIA releases are not as frequent as they should be. Um, it, OCR is ca optical character recognition, as you know, and, and that's where a text has been recognized and shows up as the ability, importantly, to search a document for keywords and copy and paste text. Everyone uses that, even people who are not visually impaired. Um, when a reporter is writing a story and they can cut and paste a quote, it saves them time and it helps. If they can search a large document of a thousand pages for particular keywords, that helps them too. These days, OCR is built in. It's easy. It's built into every scanner and industrial copying machine. It's available on every, nearly every desktop top computer. So why is it so rare in FOIA re releases? OCRing is a major factor in whether a document moves toward 508 compliance, and I'm not saying achieves, but moves toward, and OCR helps everyone. But so few FOIA offices take the step of providing OCR documents on a routine basis. Sometimes FOIA offices tell requesters that only a particular unhelpful format can be provided because the software they use, the standard FOIA software used by the agency, only allows output in a particular manner, such as a PDF. For example, if someone asks for an Excel file or a CSV file, they're handed a PDF file because of that limitation, making it much less useful and violating the provision of law that allows people to get records in the form that they are stored if possible. Most egregiously, there's locked or password protected files, and this has been happening more and more and more. I've been hearing from a lot of people. In many cases, it prevents document recipients from making the records more accessible. This is a way of, um, it's almost like blocking 508 compliance. 
by making it difficult without extraordinary workarounds and a lot of work to, um, to make the file available. The requester is told that this is agency <coughs> policy and the file cannot be released in ordinary form or unlocked form or non-password protected form. The apparent fear is that someone might make a change to the record. Uh, I think this is misguided. Sometimes um, files are password protected because they're transmitted to a requester, even though they're re released essentially to the public, because of privacy reasons. Well, I can understand that for a Privacy Act request or a first party request, but this is done for everything because the agency policy and the IT department policy is to make sure that everything is password protected that gets transmitted, even if it's put on a CD or a flash drive or emailed. So uh, this adds needless layers of digital encrustation to records, making it more complex to receive them, to open them, and to use them. And there's many people who get these records and can't open them because they don't have the password, the password doesn't work, or some other reason. Um, locking all the files, though, means that requesters and others can't do OCR. They can't merge together several files into one for usability. Concatenation is what it's technically called. They can't make the file searchable, and they can't make it useful or practicable to use for anybody. This is agency policy we're talking about. While I'm not suggesting this is done intentionally to impede the use of released records, it certainly has that effect. And it should be regarded in the, uh, it's, it is and should be regarded in the FOIA requester and open government community as, dig, as digitally obnoxious. So the problem of 508 compliance is not one that the FOIA advisory committee can solve itself, nor can it be solved by FOIA officers or FOIA professionals in the government nor really even by records managers. It's much bigger than that because it requires massive resources, IT support, and institutional commitment, which is good, but it's not something you guys can necessarily accomplish yourselves. What can be done, though, is to correct some of the common problems that requesters face on a day-to-day -day basis. These are problems that can be handled, in many cases, at the juncture point in the FOIA offices where records are scanned, redacted, prepared for release, and transmitted. Many times, documents are passed along from one part of an agency to another, repeatedly scanned and printed out, faxed and scanned, printed again, until the documents are illegible and unreadable. Such multiple generation copies, sometimes within an agency, sometimes between agencies, and sometimes within an office itself, do cause problems. And I understand there are exceptions. To, there's insta in, instances like within, for example, an agency that handles national security information where they may be limited from easily transmitting from one computer system to another. That I understand, but this happens throughout the government. The FOIA office is not the only place where things can improve, but it's the best starting place for ensuring readability and quality in records and documents being supplied. The FOIA process can be a bridge between less accessible documents and documents that are accessible and can be made accessible by members of the public. Often there are unsung heroes among FOIA staff who try to do this, but their efforts generally go unrecognized or unappreciated. Recently I had the um, a chance to avail myself of several requests to the Department of Energy and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for a book, uh, a three book series that was, the first book was just published, Hacking the Atom, and the other two, Fusion Fiasco and Lost History, will be published next month. These are books are on history of nuclear science and I think they're important and DOE was incredibly helpful on this. Very, very helpful and I think it's led from the top there. And NRC was incredibly helpful as well. In fact, DOE recently took a whole bunch of really poorly imaged documents and fixed them up and made them look beautiful on the history of the from the history of the Manhattan Project, posted this massive archive online without any fanfare and accomplished something really, truly miraculous because they made this stuff all available. So here's a few steps. First, there's a need for instruction on how to scan by FOIA professionals and staff so that documents that are that are, mo are most likely to be 508 compliant or nearly 508 compliant. FOIA staff should scan documents at a reasonable res resolution, preferably 400 DPI, no less than 300 DPI, something that can be done on any scanner but typically is not always done. Documents should not be scanned as a color scan unless they're actually in color. This is something that really burns people up who are getting these things because there's these gigantic files and they're very small and they're totally unusable because they're scanned in color because that's the default on the machine and they put everything through a color scan. It's not actually color, it looks black and white, it's just all fuzzy. Um, there should be more attention given to the quality of the scan and the orientation of the pages so the resulting product resembles the original document. Password protected or locked files should not be used unless there's a legitimate privacy reason for doing so. 
the default should be no password protection and no locking of files being given to requesters unless there's a legitimate need. FOIA software used by agencies should allow digital records to be provided in forms other than just one type that's designated by the, man by the uh, manufacturer of the software. And finally, sometimes things just go wrong despite everybody's best efforts. Agencies should be willing to re-examine an initial decision when a requester points out that it has resulted in records that are not particularly legible when compared with the original records. This is not disputes over what gets redacted and what's not. It's just, can you read it? Is it possible to go back to a previous generation, add a little bit of extra effort, and come up with something that's postable online, usable by everybody, and readable? So I would like to see the FOIA Advisory Committee find ways to encourage those simple, basic, and cost-effective steps across the government, which would also serve to move meaningfully toward 508 compliance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Michael, have, have you submitted that? I mean, obviously you had written comments uh, that you were reading from. Uh, have you submitted that? To the committee? To the committee? No, I have not. Well, it will be transcribed. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, Nikki, I was just going to say, if, it, if maybe this is standard procedure, but these are you know such informed comments. Right. I, I I hope that you'll you'll solicit written contributions mm -hmm. from them for. We are the happy to do so. Is that okay? Sure. Great. Thank you. Um, so this is it. Thank you guys for all <laughs> your work today. Um, we invite everyone to visit our website and social media for more information about our activities and how you can participate. Before exiting this room, please note that all of you must undergo the National Archives exit screen procedures to leave this building. Uh, so for security purposes, uh, security staff will inspect, uh, inspect your bags. Uh, and thank you all for coming. And we will see you uh, at our next meeting Thursday, January 26th in the McGowan Theater. And we'll post all of our future meeting dates and uh, uh, you know, other information on our website so you'll be able to uh, see when the meetings will be held. Any questions, concerns? Yes, sir. Uh, I would just suggest that uh, the uh, staff send information, guidance to the members of the committee as to what's permitted and what's not permitted by way of communications among the subcommittees. We'll do so. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We stand adjourned.